Welcome to our session on Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless, presented by Don Lane from our IoT sales team. Over to you, Don. Everybody, thank you very much for attending today. For those of you who are hanging on here, I hope that um, with all of the wireless technology we have discussed so far, you would think from a Cisco perspective, how much more can we possibly offer? And, and the answer is at least one more and probably more as the future, uh, you know, evolves and technology improves and changes throughout the years. But right now, I mean, you know, I think Ian and Kevin and Rick in regards to the Wi-Fi and the lower WAN and the 5G and LTE solutions and every one of them plays a role in the mining industry as well as in the industrial world and other verticals that we all work in. And there's a piece, there's a place generally for everything. And not everybody is going to be able to get exactly what you want. Uh, are you going to find a single wireless solution that's going to solve all your problems? The answer there is definitely not. And so as a result, I'm going to talk today a little bit about CURB, Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless uh, Backhaul, uh, which is we commonly call within Cisco CURB. Uh, and I am the CURB specialist for mining in North America. So we recognize that when it comes to wireless in the mining industry, there are multiple access te technologies that are available for your success and available for particular use cases. And whether it's Wi-Fi or lower WAN, 4G, 5G, Curb, or even WeSun, uh, each one of them play a role. And we're going to really listen hard and work with you as a customer and or a partner to understand what is the use case what are you trying to accomplish? Where are you wanting to go with this? As a result, we believe firmly that a multi-access technology is going to be required for the mining industry. If someone was to come to me and say, you know, I, I've got a connection, I want to connect up some, you know, sensors at a tailings pond. It, it, is that going to be really appropriate to put on a, um, a LTE or a 5G or um, um, a Wi-Fi connection or even 2.4? Sometimes yes. Sometimes no, um, it depends on really what you're trying to accomplish. And so we're gonna really work hard to make sure we cover the full breadth of your wireless needs as we move forward. Uh, as you've already heard already, um, you know, you've seen some of the technologies that are out there. Uh, you've, you've all worked with, you know, Wi-Fi, and I know in mining, many, many are looking at private LTE into a private 5G. And Wi-Fi, it's exciting to see the changes coming up in Wi-Fi 6 are already here, actually. But as we look forward into the technology and the move forward, CURB, Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul, as Vishal already pointed out, formerly Fluid Mesh, has a particular place that fits well in the mining space. And, and that place could be supporting connectivity for the entire mine, or it could be very focused to a, an autonomous or a teleremote solution. So when we look at our portfolio and you look at how we break down in here, uh, you know, the curb solution is, you know, in that local mobility and high throughput capabilities. Uh, we fit in that public enterprise side as best we possibly can. And, but it's an evolving product that is still getting integrated into the Cisco world and will become more and more so as we get into some next generation products. So we. We always pair it up with um, Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul with our IE Catalyst switches in CyberVision and going into security into the mining space. A lot of you heard about our security roles yesterday. Uh, when we go out into a project, you need a radio, you need a switch to connect it up generally and with a PoE port on it and you want to have some CyberVision and security out there. So let's talk about curve architectures a little bit. As I mentioned, um, it is a software defined radio. And what happens is out of the box, it's a point to point, point to multi point, or a meshed mode radio. And it's meshed for fixed architecture, not for a mobile architecture. And I'll talk about that in a second here. But when you look at the radio, it has out of the box, depending on the model, either a two and a half meg per second throughput or a 15 meg per second throughput. And that's upgradable to either 100, 150, or 500 megabits per second of throughput based on the, um, the model radio that's available and the chipset that it's running on. And so when we find ourselves in the mining world, we have a particular radio we use predominantly, which is our FM4500 series. 
That same radio can carry us from end to end, from the backhaul through distribution to the access point and all the way to the vehicle, which was a great way for sparing and um, making it easier to support it. But so that same radio can carry us into the mobility architecture. So whether you wanna apply it to the rails going into some of your mines, I have some mines where we actually have it on the mine, we have it on the rail going from the mine, and we also have it going into the port that the rail is serving. So it's a true end-to-end -end solution IP-based technology. The one thing to understand about it is it is not a Wi-Fi 802.11 protocol. So your laptop, your, la your phones are not going to see this radio. It is proprietary. It runs an MPLS protocol and allows us to have extremely low latency, very high throughput with very fast handoff times. Uh, when we look at our network capabilities, we're achieving uh, zero millisecond handoff when we come into connectivity and roaming from radio to radio on the access side. With five nines of reliability and no service provider subscriptions needed, and we can deliver up to 500 megabits per second. I have a situation in Canada um, on a terminal from coming off of a mine or a terminal on a port where we have some stacker reclaimers that are running autonomously. And those stacker reclaimers, they wanted a 500 megabit per second license. And we delivered that to them, I, although I didn't think they would ever use it. They're only using about 150 to 180, uh, but nonetheless, they're capable of delivering 500 megabits per second. And that was very important for them to meet that need. And we're doing that with around five milliseconds of latency and the, and the handoff between the radios as the, as the machines rotate is zero milliseconds. So they go along the line and it's very reliable and they have zero packet loss uh, throughout the entire operation of the solution. So when we look at our use cases, um, you know, fixed or nomadic wireless backhaul, uh, fleet management systems, FMS systems, tele-remote dozing, we are validated with CAT command, uh, ADS autonomous drilling, we have worked with autonomous drilling for Komatsu. Um, we are currently a solution that they, they uh, will use on their drills, as well as Flanders, and we're doing some testing with CAT in certain sites as well as AHS for autonomous haulage, and we are a validated design for CAT command for hauling. And we are currently in a test mode with Komatsu for tele-remote shovels. Uh, we have with both Komatsu and, and Caterpillar, ASI, uh, and some other companies, um, some I can't name, but we are currently supporting connectivity to loaders, excavators, dozers, uh, drills, and of course, autonomous haul trucks. Uh, as well as AGVs, as we get into other industries, we get into AGVs and in reality, uh, an autonomous haul truck is just a large AGV with, you know, automated guided vehicle. And then the other thing that's unique about the solution is you can add into this video cameras. You want to put a video camera on that haul truck. You want to put it on the trailer or the pole or the building. You want to add it to the drill or the shovel. You want to have a Wi-Fi hotspot at the, at the shovel. You want Wi-Fi connectivity in the pit. So when a service truck gets in there or someone's walking around with a tablet and they did the log information, hang off the end of the curb network, the backhaul, whether it's fixed or mobile, hang a Wi-Fi hotspot down there and access point giving you a Wi-Fi hotspot with live video and able to support the high throughput that you're looking for in the mining industry. If you want to use it for your backhaul network, for your SCADA or PLC networks, and also your geomechanical radar solutions. This is an interesting one. A lot of people have wanted to provide connectivity to their LIDAR systems and other radar type solutions out in the mine, but because of their throughput requirements, it's been a challenge to do so. And so they're still, in many cases, literally going out there and collecting the data manually through a flash drive or a laptop connecting up to it. With the curb solution, you can actually hook up a live radio feed and collect that information live. Other things we see, as I mentioned already, stacker reclaimers, uh, the ship loaders, backhaul, train to ground connectivity, uh, remote controlled locomotive, locomotive communication. We're doing some of that in Australia right now for some of the iron ore mines. PLC backhaul for the belt systems where you don't have a, say, a fiber connection or you're expanding and you don't want to run the fiber. 
and remote control dozers, dozers for bulk cargo and other type solutions. I have a unique scenario down on the Mississippi River where we're providing connectivity to um, basically short, ship to shore, or I should say shore to, shore to barge with a crane on it with a backhaul connection. And then from there, we actually have a wireless connection going to a, a loader that's put on another barge that's run tele-remote about 25 to 30 miles away. And so these unique scenarios are something that Curb specializes in. So what are some of the benefits? We're connecting on the move assets, uh, providing an ultra resilient wireless connection, um, you know, traveling on trains. I mean, this doesn't apply to the mining industry too much, but to us, it doesn't matter if it's one kilometer per hour, a half kilometer per hour, or all the way up to 300 kilometers per hour or operating a remote truck, you know, it's 400 ton with a 13 foot tire going down the road. It operates, operates reliably with a curb network. Uh, we can also handle the large, uh, the challenging situations, you know, the extreme environments, uh, the large complex manufacturing facilities, oil and gas refineries, ports. Uh, you want connectivity to some of your refining processes on the mine. You want to get connectivity out to the tailing ponds. You want to get it out to a monitoring station for maybe a dewatering pump. All of this can be connected with the curb solution. So how do we do this? Uh, we call it Prodigy, and it's an MPLS, proprietary MPLS-based transmission protocol. So, and I say that because it, we were the first company to take the MPLS and put it into a wireless environment. So if you have MPLS on your, some of your wired fiber networks, you're not going to find that the tagging is going to compa be comparable. Um, they are separated. It is proprietary, but it's a technology that allows us to have through this you know, optimized algorithm to give us high priority reliable for, reliability for every single packet that we transmit. Um, it's going to give us extremely robust high interference capabilities. Each radio is a dual polarity solution, giving you low latency and jitter. So this is something that comes with every single radio. It's standard, it's built into it, as well as other features and functionality. As I mentioned, we are software-based, so if you need to add AES encryption, you need to add VLAN, you have a particular requirement of tele-remote or autonomy where you need Profinet. Uh, we have a Profinet plugin that goes onto the radio and, or maybe it's CAN bus or FIPS 140, well, probably not too much FIPS 140 in the mining industry, but all of these functions are available in the curb solution. So when we look at it, I focus pretty much in one radio, although we have a few radios, which I'll show in a moment. The primary radio I focus in the mining industry is what we call the FM 4500. And the reason being for this is because it gives one radio that can carry us from end to end. Uh, you can have literally one radio sitting on the shelf as a spare. You get a lightning strike, or, you know, or if someone does a hard impact damage or whatever it might be. And you can literally pull that radio off the shelf and apply a template to it. What is its use case? Is it a mobility radio on the vehicle? Is it a track radio on the access layer side? Is it part of the distribution backhaul network? You apply these templates accordingly and you have one radio that gives it all. So when we're can looking at on? this, Yes. Uh, just to interject here for a second, and you may have covered this while I was answering questions, so my apologies if it's a duplicate, but um, there's been some discussion about uh, about distances on curb and kind of what the RF profile looks like. Um, I, I'm expecting it's similar to Wi-Fi because it's in the same sort of spectrum. Uh, talk to us a bit about that. It is. I was going to talk to it in a moment here, but I'll mention okay, it. Well, we, we can do it in a bit. I just wanted to make sure you're aware of the question. We we, uh, we fall in the uni one, two and three spectrum at the moment. And so four, nine to five point eight and um, five point eight, seven, five. Uh, we will go into the higher um, uni up to uni eight and when the new versions come out. But today that's uni one, two and three, mostly one and three. Um, we have solutions that with high gain antennas, and we're going to choose the antenna choice based on the use case mm, and the area point. that needs to be covered. So a lot of this is going to be dependent upon those types of design situations. Of course, terrain is going to play a role in that. But as an example, I have uh, some autonomous drills running on a site in Canada that um, the pad has four autonomous drills running on it. And these four drills are within visibility to some degree of three trailers. The one trailer is 500 meters away. 
The other one is 800 meters away and the other one is 1400 meters away. So just approximately a mile. And it's all based on the RSS high values of the, the signal. And the system has got to automatically connect to those, those radios based on what's available. So as a haul truck goes by and may block one of the trailer connections, within zero milliseconds, we're going to automatically roam to the other radio. And I have seen literally, where well, we have seen connections roam from any one of those three trailers from 500 meters all the way up to 1400 meters uh, of packet loss. And because and, we can work at an RSSI value that's very low. Um, generally, you can find a very consistent but stable signal at in the Abrams, you know, as we're stating here, NEG 66. And that's really, that's great if you can achieve it. Um, Wi-Fi generally wants to be a little bit better. We actually have situations uh, where the ones we did that were 1400 meters away and it was running at NEG 82. And, okay. and we were supporting the connectivity to autonomous drills, ADS and or teleremote. So it does depend a bit on the radio, right? And what you're saying is your radios are a bit more sensitive than a lot of Wi-Fi radios. Sensitive in the sake of a better thing, yes. Right, exactly. Yes. They're able to pick up lower signals, right? And we do that because we have a dual polarity uh, capability and the, how we, the algorithms of how we handle the signals. And I'm not, I don't have time to get into the weeds of- No, that's totally cool. No, it that. gives us a ballpark, right? But that's yeah, good. it gives you a ballpark. And, I'm, and I've got some systems, uh, not in mining, but in other industries that are going uh, over two kilometers away and providing good connectivity. Uh, when it comes to a point to point, we can take the same radio with a particular dish antenna. And we have scenarios where we're delivering 40 megabits of throughput up to 25 miles. So- wow. Again, this this is and that's using the exact same radio that's doing the access side for the mobility. So you can that's a true end to end connectivity with the same radio. From a Cisco perspective, as we move into the autonomous mining solution continuity or world, you're going to see a, um, a trend and the trend is going to be where we're going to be pressing more towards curb being utilized for the autonomous solutions. Uh, connectivity for the dozers and the whether it's AHS or ADS or teleremote or any autonomous you know and or teleremote solution within mining and the new CVD 2.0 as Bruce brought up yesterday her will be incorporated into that for that very use so you'll see this coming up I know the question is going to come up and it's going to be asked about is curb available and uh, can we work with DNAC and the answer today is no the, it is on the roadmap. Um, I can't say that it's going to be in this first generation that's coming out at the end of this calendar year, but the plans are on the roadmap that it will be in the future generation. Uh, as, as everybody has indicated, Cisco uh, believes in having everything work together through a commonality of a solution uh, from security to DNAC, um, you know, whatever dashboard it needs to run on, it will eventually get there, but not in the first iteration. So. Keep an eye on it and you'll see that coming through. So the portfolio is pretty straightforward. Um, as I indicated, the FM 4500 is my choice for mining. I have a mine I'm doing right now uh, in Montana. It's 100% FM 4500 with the, I shouldn't say 100%, 99.9. We have a few Wi-Fi access points in various locations where Wi-Fi is necessary. And we had one solution where we had to go over a very, very crowded town. And we had to, they, the partner had to go with a different solution because uh, it was too crowded on the spectrum. But so in that, just to be clear on our, like just to get a bit of a sense of the architecture here. So in that particular use case where you're covering most, pretty much the whole mine, um, you're, you're doing backhaul scenarios where you've got high gain antennas for backhaul. Yep. You're also doing uh, local access scenarios that are more mobility oriented, right? Um, with with antennas on moving vehicles. Um, but you said at the beginning that, you know, Wi-Fi devices and you end user Wi-Fi devices and LTE devices obviously don't have curb radios in them. How do they connect to this infrastructure? So they literally piggyback on through the uh, system. And so you'll hang a Wi-Fi access point, for example, in this scenario, they knew they needed Wi-Fi in various locations throughout the mine. So we provided a, a wireless backhaul network throughout the entire mine. They have very little fiber out there. Uh, there was only a few places where fiber was available and the cost of installing fiber was very prohibitive. 
So we extended a curb point-to-point, -point, point to multi-point network throughout the entire mine to cover whether it's a trailer or on a building. They got lucky. They don't have a need for a lot of trailers. They have a fortunate where they can have a lot more permanent infrastructure, poles or buildings. So we were able to put access points on those areas. And in some of those areas, for example, one of the buildings is a service area where the trucks come into the ready line, the hotline uh, for shift change. So they want Wi-Fi access there because when the service trucks arrive, they wanted to be able to have a gentleman get out of the truck, uh, or I should say an operator, gentleman or lady, and operate a tablet or some other device where they collect information live. So a, a, it could have been approached with two methodologies, and we did do both methodologies. One of them was for a fixed location on a pole uh, that was close to the area of the hotspot or the ready line. And the other one was a, literally a Wi-Fi access point that was on the service truck. So it was that service truck was getting up there to fuel, uh, load oil, or, you know, or they want to track all of this. And they're trying to get away from pen and paper, and they want to do it live. We're in a now world. And, and they also wanted a video solution on it. So these trucks will have video, a Wi-Fi access point, and will deliver the curb connectivity through what we call a solution called fluidity to that vehicle. And so it's literally a mobile backhaul network. And we don't care if it's moving or mobile, I'm sorry, or fixed. It's all connected and backhauled and you can add an access port where you want. They also did it on the shovels. So the other area where they felt they would have connectivity or needs for Wi-Fi was on the shovels. One of the main areas there was because of service. As you try to get connection to say a, a cat uh, technician, Remotely, he wants to be able to see what's going on. So you can take a, a tablet and literally Wi-Fi connect it up and show them this is what's going on with this particular PLC or you know something on the shovel, and and that information is fed live to the technician who might be sitting in Peoria, Illinois, or so. Li live video like that over top wouldn't be a problem. It doesn't mess with existing autonomous systems or anything? It does not at all. We can carve out that space, you know, whether you put it into a VLAN and then also in, in assigning the QoS levels on the radio to support it. So that way the autonomous or tele-remote solutions are always getting the first priority and then everything else is a, a second priority. But yeah. in this, most cases we find that those priorities are usually don't conflict with each other and because we can deliver such a high throughput with low latency. So the product selection is uh, is not very broad. And it's going to get narrower as the new model comes out. You'll find that the 4500 series, as I indicate here, is the best choice for mining. Uh, Bruce showed this image yesterday, uh, which is part of our new CVD that's coming out. And I wanted to bring it up again. You'll see here that a fair amount of this is curb radios. And again, from an end-to-end -end scenario, from the core all the way out to the distribution layer, all the way out to the vehicles, you can use the same radios. Uh, in this particular instance, we've got a combination of 4200s and 4500s. Uh, we're starting to see more of that change to all 4500s. So here's a typical distribution layer network for a surface mine. And I'll have a little bit coming up for an underground. And so this is a, and, and they may not be exactly this method, but you have a tower and you might feed fiber to that tower and that might feed to one trailer and it could mesh over to another trailer or point to point to another trailer, which is most likely the case. And then we'll have an access point in there that'll feed off to the vehicles. So when we look at a distribution and access layer for a surface mine, again, we have the tower and we're gonna run a backhaul network from the tower, pole, or whatever it might be to that trailer. And that trailer doesn't have to be a trailer. It could be a pole building. It doesn't really matter to us. And we're gonna provide that connectivity again, end to end. And the antenna is going to be the difference between them. It could be the same radio, but we could have multiple antenna choices. This is a typical FMS solution, fleet management solution. As we move, you'll notice here uh, on the haul truck, I have two radios and we've got a, a Cisco IE 3400H switch, hardened switch. Why do we have two radios? Uh, even Caterpillar uh, um, questioned this, this a lot. A lot of times you go on, there's a lot of blind spots on a haul truck or these large vehicles. And so as the truck's making a turn, you've got a truck that's that large, 
you get a lot of shadowing and it, it affects your coverage. So how do you compensate for that? You compensate for it by putting in more infrastructure, more poles, more trailers, more access points, or you go the other way around and we do it all from the edge. So we have a machine learning on every radio, I'll, uh, advance in, you know, in, in learning on it. And as the radios are connected, we have two radios on the truck. And instead of one radio on the truck being divided, we take a 30 dBm signal and divide it with you know, an LMR running on each side, which is often gets cut as we're surfacing it. Uh, we're gonna run a radio on each side that we would use, both running, feed, you know, having a 30 dBm power and we'll just run a Cat5 that's weatherproofed across them, much easier to replace and cheaper. And then we'll interface them with the switch. And we have a technology called Titan. And what it allows us to do is it allows us to have multiple radios on a vehicle where we have a shadowing situation. And they will act as one unit or one solution. So one radio is actually doing the communication and the other radio is just waiting for the other one to break. And so within our, our machine learning, the our artificial intelligence, we have a make before break technology that's always literally saying out there, I know where you've been, I know where you're at, and I know you're going to lose the connection here in a few moments, and before you break it, I'm gonna make the, the connection, and I'm gonna move it to the next radio as the vehicle moves around. And then we get onto a dozer, it's a single radio, a shovel, it, it could be a single radio, uh, and then drills, I usually do drills always as two radios, but then we get into for autonomy, autonomy or tell remote, and the differences become on a shovel, I would go to a dual radio. On a drill, I would put four radios, and then when I would put two radios for the access side. And all this is doing is providing us that coverage because when we're dealing with a fleet management system, 40, 50, 60% coverage is, is adequate. Uh, it's a store and forward system, very forgiving. You don't have to have 100% coverage. But as we move into the autonomous world, tele-remote, there's no exceptions. We have to have 100% coverage in the operating areas. So as a result, um, in a good example, in this mining, this mine project I'm working with, I mentioned a little bit ago, they decided to go with Curb because they knew in about three to four years, they're gonna go fully autonomous. And all they have to do when they decide to go autonomous is that we will go through and do a refresh in the engineering with the, with the partner, and we may have to increase the density a little bit. We may have to add some access point at the certain locations, and then we may have to increase the number of radios on say the drills and or the shuttles, because now we have to have that 100% coverage. We can't afford to lose connectivity. So this is where the curb solution comes into play. So we gave them a roadmap, a transitional path to move to autonomous and or tele remote, and they can do that with curb as a carry forward fashion. I mentioned the new, new radio a little while ago, and they purchased a radio today because we're software defined. That new radio is compatible, backwards compatible to the radios that are available today. Matter of fact, curb radios are still, we're still supporting radio number one uh, within the fluid mesh network. And so it's that software defined capability gives us a lot of runway for using the radios for a very long period of time. So here's a typical setup for tele-remote operation. So you can either choose the core to be fiber to the first point and then run a wireless backbone, or you may run wire, fiber all the way out past the, the backbone, or it may even run all the way out as far as the trailer. And then we'll have distribution levels based on the usage. So when you look at this, you think, okay, I've got a core with a data center oops, of, 400, of 250 megabits, uh, we can go more and I have a backbone of 200 and I have distribution of 30 and I have access at 30. Why do I have that? Well, as if I had the um, two drills, or two, I'm sorry, two excavators, as this image shows, then I would probably have that distribution running at 160 to 100 and 150 to be able to take care of that aggregated amount. And, and it's all gonna depend on the use case. We're doing a test right now with Komatsu, and it's this exact scenario as you're seeing right here in front of you. Actually, this is the layout at the moment, and we're running from the core. We have a gateway, we call it. And it's not a controller. It's a controllerless environment. And so this core is an MPLS gateway. It allows to aggregate the MPLS traffic, and when we do a fluidity solution, which is our mobile solution, we always put a core on it, and they happen to have fiber running right to the trailer, which we see 
surprisingly or not, I see that more often, more and more. And then we have an access radial that's going to the excavator, two radials in the excavator with axiomatic power supplies, and then an IE3400 switch. And actually, actually, I have the wrong image there. That should be an IE3400H. Uh, I didn't have time to change the image before I, this presentation. And the reason being is all of the 4500 radios are hardened radios designed for mining, and they have an M12 X coded data port connection, as do the 3400Hs. And so we have an M12 X coded cable running between each one. I have an example actually of the antenna right here behind me. So a typical setup for underground. When they look at an underground situation. Hey, Don. Yeah. I was just going to mention on the trailer configuration you had in the previous slide there. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, that we do have antenna partners for curb that can give you self homing antennas as well for trailers. That that can be a challenge if you've got people moving trailers around that don't know about you know aiming at But you have to be careful. So depending on the solution, for example. At a cat command solution, a validated solution. Ah, uh, good point. You yeah. must use the, the the antennas that were validated. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. So, and therefore, you have to also use the the uh, the power supplies that are validated, the radios, everything that's validated. So, there's no deviation there. And uh, we're, although Komatsu hasn't quite gone to that direction yet. Uh, they are looking at it more and more because they're wanting to have a reliable solution for their customer. And, and we're yeah. seeing this with others as well. So bear that in mind when you're out there. It, you just don't want to just slap up an antenna because you think it might be the better solution. Um, you know, and you want to stick to what's been validated. And the nice thing about the validation is, is that you don't have to do a, a proof of concept. We've already done that. We've already provided all that. I had a uh, cat command solution the other day for a mine and they wanted me to provide a test and I said, sorry, we, we can't do that. Um, there's too much complexity here. It's already been validated. And so as long as we utilize the materials that were validated, you're good to go. And I have been within Cisco. I'm the guy that uh, drives that message home very clearly. So, um, so for underground, you know, it's very similar, um, but you'll find in the underground, a lot of mines are able to run fiber, but in some of the older mines, they might have some leaky feeder out there. And the leaky feeder is as much as you might want or think that you can run, uh, you know, a wireless connectivity to a vehicle, that's a challenge. And it doesn't work as well as people want, that would like, although many have tried, and I know most have failed. So as a result, they lean towards running fiber, and if they don't have the luxury of running fiber, they'll come in and run a, a, a curb distribution network. So you might have fiber to the first radio or even the second one. And then we'll run a specialized antenna that if you look at that antenna, it's kind of, uh, if you know anything about antennas, it's sort of like a Yagi antenna that's encapsulated, designed for underground. This was designed by curb, by fluid mesh, for this particular use case. And the reason why I, I state that is, one of the things that Curb or Fluid Mesh has been most known for is train to ground connectivity. And we have projects where we have hundreds, if not thousands of miles around the world of underground tunnels where these trains are, are traveling through. A good example, we have a large project uh, in Moscow for the metro system. And I've been told, uh, and there's one person on the call here who can validate this for me, but I've been told that up to 85 per, 80 or 85 percent of that solution is underground and, and there's about 5,000 radios on that one network and so when you have such a large system underground and you have trains going at relatively high speeds reliable connections are key and in that scenario uh, we would provide connectivity to the train using these distribution points and then we would bridge it through the switch to the access layer and then put the same radio on the vehicles on a train we'll have another radio on there and it's usually a cisco wi-fi access point to provide a customer experience just like we would put on a shovel you want to put a video camera on every one of these vehicles you can uh, you want to put a wi-fi access point on every single one of them you can and we just need to know this in advance so we can accommodate the throughput requirements that you have or potentially would need 
So uh, towards the very end here, and I know yesterday a lot of questions came up about what does the curb formerly fluid mesh solution have for configuration and monitoring of the solution? And I think we're good on time, Roland. Yeah, we got about uh, five minutes, I think. I'm going to quickly jump over to another screen and I'm going to share with everybody very quickly here. I've, I've keyed up, uh, we have some demos of each of our solutions and I just wanted to show everybody what we have. You can connect into each radio individually and you can see this particular radio is currently in a demo mode uh, listed as a cloud managed radio or we can turn that off and not have it as cloud. And what's nice about this is you can go into each radio, change your configuration, you look at what's going on in the wireless radio, change your IP addresses, change your frequencies. Uh, you want to do antenna alignment. Each radio, it's kind of nice. There's a there's a little bar on the radio that I kind of kind of look like a like a cell phone signal. And the the more bars you have, the more in line that they are. Uh, this one here is a pretty strong signal, NEG35, and so it's very well aligned. We can do a variety of things with it. You want to hook up uh, SNMP, you know, and bring it out to SolarWinds or What's Up Gold. You want to add a radius server to it. You want to add uh, NTP. All of these functionalities are available on a per radio basis. But now you want, to, you're a partner, for example, and you want to configure these radios uh, for a large deployment. And to go on to every single radio is quite the challenge. So a lot of partners or people would take them into their facilities and they would add in uh, multiple radios on a single switch and they would develop these temp with templates. They would pull out a configuration template and you can see here is one for fluidity infrastructure. I mentioned that the vehicle, the mesh and failover, uh, a variety of things. And we would go in and we would upload those templates to that group of radios. And the only variation is going to be um, the IP address. And so you would change that and maybe you want to put a particular name on it. Uh, you can manage their sites with different projects. Uh, you can configure your devices. You can remotely, if, they're, if they are connected to the cloud, you can remotely upgrade the firmware, obviously do that in a very um, methodical fashion. Don't do the first one, do the last one at the end and then work your way in. But you can do this remotely. And if you don't want to have it in the cloud, it is not required. You can leave it just through the individual radios and you can push this information up actually through your network. You can get it all ready to go through RACER as we call it, and then have a single file look connect it to your network and push it out to all the radios simultaneously on the network. Uh, you would want to do, do it in groups. And then Further on, we have a tool called FM Monitor. And as I already mentioned, these solutions today are not integrated into DNAC or any other Cisco systems. That will come in time. But we developed the FM Monitor because we had a situation where you get into these very large networks and you need to monitor them, you need to maintain them. And so we wanted something that was going to be unique, that was going to help us not only monitor these systems, but also help commission them, help, you know, understand what's going on and, you know, develop history and logs of the system, add topology, give you data analysis. And so when you look at something like SolarWinds or you know, What's Up Gold or some of the other ones that are out there, they're going to have a sampling rate of 30 seconds to a minute. The FM monitor has a sampling rate of every 300 milliseconds. So when you're de developing a network for a mobility solution for vehicle connectivity, that 300 milliseconds is critical in developing and, and, and fine tuning your system and monitoring it to give you a better solution. So there's a variety of, uh oh, I may have been off on it too long. <laughs> Let me get back in there, sorry. I had it sitting on standby for too long probably in the demo mode. There's a variety so, of ways. Just a question, I guess, Don, as we wrap up here. Um, can you, uh, is, is there a need for this to be in the cloud or is this the same on-prem? Like, is there a difference? So FM Monitor is an on-prem solution today. Okay. Um, Cisco is currently discussing um, being able to figure out a way to make it both on-prem or in the cloud as an option. But uh, today it's just an on-prem solution. 
And cool. we have it from a five to rate five radios all the way up to five thousand. Thanks, Don, and thank you for watching this session on Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless. This concludes day two of our virtual mining summit. If you missed any of the sessions over the last uh, two days worth of sessions, uh, please circle back and start again at the beginning with our session on Mining 2.0, our Cisco validated design, an interview with Bruce Frederick.